So, um, welcome to this uh, public presentation by Dr. Susan Grajek, who's visiting campus today uh, as part of the MSU's visioning process. My name is Tom Peters, the Dean of Libraries here at MSU and Chair of the Visioning Infrastructure Task Force, which is looking at three basic things. IT, the topic of today's talk. Also, facilities, or as I like to say, the built environment here at MSU across all of our vast real estate uh, holdings around South Bend, Missouri. Uh, and then thirdly, environmental sustainability. So those are the three topics we're working on. We're very pleased to have Dr. Grajek with us this afternoon today. She's the VP for Data Research and Analytics at Educause, which is a nonprofit association whose mission is to advance higher education through the use of information technology. Um, before joining the Educause, Dr. Grajek spent over 25 years at Yale University in various um, uh, high profile and uh, uh, innovative positions, including most recently as Deputy Relationship Manager in Yale's Information Technology Services, RTS. Her doctorate is in uh, research psychology from Yale, and she's held a faculty appointment at the, at the Yale University School of Medicine's Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. Her expertise uh, encompasses the design and execution of research and management, the behavioral sciences and public policy, as well as in statistical analysis. She also has an established background in IT planning, assessment, and metrics, as well as IT operational leadership. Um, our plan today is she's going to speak for roughly a half hour, and then we'll open up for Q&A and discussion. And, um, clogging if we want to, or Irish dancing, wine, whatever we want to do uh, for the remainder of the hour. Just want to let you know that we've had several requests to record this session because people couldn't make it. Uh, so we are being recorded, so we're, we're, we're shooting for a G rating. Just put it out there, we're shooting for a G rating. Uh, I've got the camera so just should catch the two of us and not you, but if you say something, we'll go on the, on the tape. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Grayson. Thank you very much. Uh, I am absolutely delighted by the invitation to come here. Okay. What especially delighted me were two things. The first is the, the pleasure uh, at, that I get from visiting campuses uh, and how much I learn. So I think I'll probably learn at least as much as you all do. But the second was the fact that you are interested enough in hearing about information technology, where information technology is headed in higher education at this very important time in your in the <coughs> institution's history. Celebrating your 110th anniversary this week, congratulations. Uh, and undergoing the visioning portion of a strategic planning initiative. So I'm really thrilled that you want to hear more about information technology. So what I'm going to do is, first I'm going to show you the top 10 IT issues of 2015. These slides will be available to you after the talk, so you don't have to worry about uh, taking notes or about taking photos, but you certainly can if you would like. Let me tell you a little bit about where these issues came from. Every year at Educause, I have the pleasure of leading a group called the IT Issues Panel. The IT Issues Panel is comprised of about two dozen leaders in higher education and higher education technology. Actually, throughout the world, but primarily in the United States. We select uh, leaders, uh, CIOs, um, senior IT leaders, we've had college presidents, uh, faculty, um, provosts and the like on our IT Issues Panel, and they're roughly representative of the demographic of higher education institutions. So, some major research universities, some public, private, community colleges, and the like. That group meets throughout the year, and as we meet throughout the year, I ask them several questions, but there's one question I ask them every time, and that is, what is the most strategic IT-related issue that's facing your institution at this time? And I listen and they talk. And from that, they identify a short list of three to five IT issues that are important to their institution at that time. Then for a culminating activity, we review those lists of the top issues, and then we look forward. And I ask them from those lists, from other things that they know and they can predict for the coming year, 
what do they think will be the most strategic IT-related issues facing higher education? Well, then we take it a step further because they generally identify a slate of 15 to 20 issues. We send that slate of issues out to the Educause membership to vote on. So this is a rank order. Number one was the highest rated issue. Uh, number 10 uh, was, was uh, number 10th on the list. And then we also have on our website, the Educause website, you can see breakdowns of the top 10 IT issues for various types of colleges and universities. So you can look at MSU's Harvey Classification and see what right time today. Now, I wish I had time to tell you all about all 10 of the top 10 IT issues. But we have an hour, and we really want to spend as much of that time talking with you. So I worked, and we narrowed it down to three issues. But before we go there, what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we thought about the issues. We didn't just think of it as a list of 10 issues. We thought of it as we identified themes that are facing higher education at this time. Three different themes, inflection point from technical to business and the new normal. So this is how we've kind of organized the themes iconically. So if you read the article in Educause Review Magazine, those icons will be familiar to you. They're the icons that we used in the article. And let me tell you a little bit about the inflection point theme. Well, um, it all starts with Moore's Law. And uh, you may be familiar with Moore's Law. It's, uh, it's a very old law, and it was really not positive as a law at the time, but as kind of a prediction, which said that roughly technology, and in this case it was processor capacity, would roughly double um, over, uh, over a period of time. Different people have different interpretations of that period. I've seen it as short as nine months, as long as 24 months. Generally, 18 months is the most common form. Uh, common form. Uh, and more positive this, I think, in the early 60s. And indeed, this has turned out to be the case. So there's all these articles that you'll see every once in a while. Is Moore's Law over? Have we finally exceeded this? You know, or have, have we flattened out? Not yet. And the other interesting thing is that Moore's Law applies to many aspects of technology. Processor speed, storage capacity, network capacity. And so it's really proved to be a wonderful, robust analogy for the pace of change in IT. Well, you see a straight line, but this straight line actually represents exponential growth. And exponential growth is very important to our story. Because exponential growth is particularly powerful. And I'll illustrate it um, using a story that McAfee and Brynolfsson talked about in their recent book, The Second Machine Age, which is all about how technology is uh, reaching a very powerful impact on society in many, many different ways. And so what they talked about was the parable of the chessboard, and this parable, many, many years old, is about the wise man who invented the game of chess. He invented it for a king who loved to play games. And the king loved this game. He was so delighted and so impressed that he said to the wise men, name your reward. So the wise men very modestly looked down and he said, well, I just asked one thing. Let's start with my chessboard. And for the first square of the chessboard, just put one grain of rice or wheat, whatever. Um, then in the second, put two grains. And then in the third, double that. And just do that until we fill the grains with all of the squares of the chessboard. Well, the king couldn't believe what a modest reward this man was asking for. Because really, you look at these first things and you think, maybe this will feed him for a month. It can't be that much. You see the piles growing bigger. But what's really interesting about this is the chessboard analogy. You start with one up there, and then you get to a number that I can't even pronounce, um, but an unimaginably large number. And the other thing about this, and the reason that, uh, that, that McAfee, uh, McAfee and Brynolfsson posit that higher education, I'm sorry, that IT has really entered a new age, is when you look at what happens roughly when you get to the second half of the chessboard. And this is an analogy that Ray Kurzweil first pointed out and observed that 
the, the power of doubling really reaches massive and indeed transformative potential when you get roughly <coughs> to that second half of the chest wave. And that's when, in this case, technology doesn't just move faster, doesn't just store more things, but it actually can become so powerful that it can break through some barriers and deliver on some promises that we only thought about in Star Trek and the Twilight Zone and our imaginations. And that's the age that McAfee and Brindleson posit that we're entering now, an inflection point in technology. Well, we also are seeing a bit of an inflection point in higher education. Uh, these graphs are all over the place. Uh, you know, they're, they're easy to find. This is from Bloomberg. Um, but it shows, since 1978, um, the rate at which tuition and fees has increased in comparison to medical care, which was the last poster child for too much cost and too fast increases, and in relation to housing, the consumer price index, and food. And you can see the cost of higher education have been going up much, much faster. Well, you and I can see this in this room, but so can everybody else. Students, parents, <coughs> legislators. And so suddenly, higher education is under the microscope. And people were pretty much content to let us do our wonderful thing, educate students, create knowledge with research and scholarship, and trusted us to do a good job on that. But now they're seeing that the peppers really come home to pay, and they don't want to pay those bills. And they're looking at higher education and saying, why can't you run yourself like a business? Why can't you be more efficient? Why can't you blow these costs? So we're also under a microscope. And that's another huge, huge change for higher education. Now there's a third inflection point that I also wanted to point out that's part of this story. And that's the inflection point of change. Another Moore, in this case Jeffrey Moore, who wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm, was interested in learning what makes change really take. <coughs> and we know that with just about any population, there'll be the people who will be really embracing and open to change, you know? Can I have a guinea pig in the audience? They're the ones who will raise the people, right? There you go. <laughs> you'll be able to watch, right? <laughs> and then there are the people who will be the last to change. You know, they'll be they'll you know? they, don't, they don't want to change. And then there's the mainstream, who they don't want to go too fast. They really like the safety and the comfort of that crowd. So they'll look to their left, look to the right, and when they see the mainstream moving, then they will move with the mainstream. Which creates a dilemma for change, right? Because the early adopters for technology, they'll go, they'll go real fast. But the rest of the mainstream, the mainstream won't because they're waiting for the rest of the mainstream to go. You know, after you, no, after you, no, after you, right? And so what do you do then? Well, what Moore found in his studies was he found that you can actually break off a group of that mainstream, those mainstream adopters, into the group that may actually take that adoption. And what that adoption has to do for them to act is that adoption has to solve a particularly thorny and painful problem for them. And it has to fit it like a glove. So if you can design a solution with technology that solves a serious pain point, point for a group of that early majority, they will cross that case and they will jump and the rest of the herd will likely go with them. And so what we're seeing now is we're seeing that as technology has matured, as we have reached pain points of cost issues in our higher education systems, and as many faculty and students have come expecting more with technology in higher education, that we have, the early adopters have gone, but in addition, there is a group of pragmatists who say, I'm willing to take the leap and adopt this technology that may help me contain costs, that may help me do some of the innovative things that my faculty want to do, that may help address some of those student needs. And so that's what we're finding, because what we're finding is that the pain is coming at the same time that the solutions have matured so they can deliver in a more reliable
and less cockamamie way than some of the have in the past and will still. So that's why we're positive that we went to an inflection point this year. Well, let me give you some data that can also perhaps make my case and bring it real. Uh, so last year, uh, this is a survey that we do every year, and we survey uh, colleges and universities on the technologies that they are employing at their institutions right now. And in 2014, these six technologies were in place at 30% or more of colleges and universities. So then we asked people, we also asked institutions, uh, what are your plans for a whole bunch of other technologies that are not in place right now at more than 30% of colleges and universities? And they said, well, we're going to implement, we're planning an implementation, we're just tracking it, we're not doing anything. From that, we were able to project adoption forward a few years. Now, by the end of the decade, we are guessing that this many technologies may be in place. These were all on the survey in 2014. And in 2014, they were only, only six of them were in place at 30% of institutions. But based on the rate of, at which colleges and universities are implementing technologies today, we're guessing that this is what the future looks like. Uh, this is uh, another bit of data that just came out in January, and this is from that same survey. And what we did um, in that survey also was we grouped the different technologies by family, and we looked at the pace of adoption and the level of adoption, and we're predicting that mobile technologies are going to make the greatest progress. They're going to grow the fastest, and adoption by 2020, we're, we're guessing, is going to be the highest, so we're predicting the greatest growth in there. Um, least in emergent technologies, which is not surprising because they're so experimental. Um, not so much in devices, but you can see the other area, enterprise technologies. Enterprise technologies um, tend to be uh, um, things like administrative IT systems and the business systems and the like. User support technologies, research and scholarship, there's an asterisk there because um, that's for doctoral institutions only. We restricted ourselves to that. So this kind of gives you a sense of how um, different technology families we're predicting are going to grow. Another theme from technical to business, I'll just quickly um, talk about that. And, and, and the notion with this is this is about how IT organizations and professionals interact with the institution. And IT has gone from in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s from managing technologies, running technologies, running servers, networks, and the like, to around the turn of the century, conceiving of itself as managing services. And that's when we stopped tending to talk about the people we serve as users and started talking about them perhaps as customers or clients or things like that and really adopting a service orientation and framework and with methodologies to boot. And now we are also having to take on the mantle of contributing to the strategic conversations at the college and university. So it's no longer just about the IT services, about the technologies, but it's also about how IT can deliver on the strategic needs of the colleges and universities. So Educause even rerun our mission. We're advancing higher education through the use of technology. Higher education comes first. And then finally, the new normal is the last theme. And uh, you can supporting users um, and security policies for mobile, cloud, and digital. That doesn't sound very strategic, does it? But the reason it's on the list is that so much has changed with students bringing two, three, four, five, six devices to campus and expecting to be able to access the LMS on those devices, um, get their homework, do their homework, access the network on those devices, uh, uh, faculty wanting to store data in the cloud, on Dropbox and the like so that they can get it anywhere they like and all kinds of other demands and expectations that our users are bringing. And as well as that, all kinds of new and growing and additive security issues and implications. So even the normal is new and different now. So I 
said to Tom, with the time you're giving me, I really should limit myself to three. And this was me really talking to myself as well, because I tend to try to pack in more than less in a presentation. And I said, could you tell me the three issues that you would like me to focus on, if you had to pick three? Within 10 minutes, Tom went back, he said, enterprise IT architecture, technology, and teaching and learning, supporting users in the new normal. You can read about all the other issues in the January, February issue of Educause Review Magazine. It's online. Um, and it contains a lot of data, descriptions of the issues, as well as advice and guidelines for you. Um, and I'll also make sure that you have access to um, all 10 issues in the presentation. But let's start with enterprise IT architecture. Um, I'm going to make an educated guess and guess that there's a lot of people in this room who know what architecture is, they know what IT is, they kind of know what enterprise is, not the Starship, but <laughs> enterprise IT architecture, what is that? What is she talking about? Um, so, uh, what enterprise IT architecture is, and I'll just show you a quote um, here from one of our panelists, is enterprise archi IT architecture is a way of systematically looking at your data, your systems, and your services in understanding that they all need to map and link together to form a coherent whole, and managing that whole as a whole, as well as a collection of end parts. And that if you do that, it will enable you to make better decisions about new system acquisitions, about when and how and where to retire technologies and the like. You'll be really looking at this in a more systematic way. Kind of if you went to the library um, and they didn't use the Library of College classification <coughs> system and, well, the books are all there, the journals are all there, you know, just find them, wander through the stacks or, or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a way to organize and manage um, these services. And it's increasingly being seen by higher education as something that's not just nice to do for people with OCD who like to organize things, but it's really necessary to do in order to manage your services well and cost effectively. So here's what we know, here's some data. Uh, a, a couple of, uh, of, of technology practices that are emerging um, are related to enterprise architecture. They're really related to doing a better job of, of organizing and managing your technical resources. Um, one is called DevOps, and that can help improve quality and reliability. Um, and what DevOps is, is, well, if you had four people up here, they'd all give you a different definition of DevOps because it's an emerging standard and practice. But roughly, it means, um, and I'm going to amaze you with this, but that the people who are developing the technology actually work and collaborate closely with the people who are operating the technology. So that the development and the operations work seamlessly and in sync. And it's really trying to, trying to cross that white space <coughs> in the organizational chart. So that's what uh, the DevOps movement is all about. And you can see that 11% of colleges and universities have already incorporated this, and another 18% say it's exerting a major influence on their IT strategy. Um, agile may be something that you're more familiar with, because it's certainly become a buzzword. Um, we are <coughs> agile um, in fill in the blank, right? And the point with agile is that uh, we used to think in IT, that you really could create a blueprint, like building a building, and then build to that blueprint, to those specifications, and at the end, you would have what you were hoping for, and it would serve the needs that you were hoping for to serve. Um, well, it's taken us many, many years in IT to know that IT projects just don't work that way. And so what Agile does is it says, we know where we want to head, we know where we are today, and we know the next few steps to take. So what are we going to do to be able to make the best progress over those next few clear steps? And then we'll get to another point and make some more progress going forward. And in fact, what it tries to do is, rather than design the great big building at once, it designs what's called the minimum viable product. So what's the smallest thing we can do to start with? 
And then from there, we'll have a better understanding of what we created. And that will give us a better understanding of what we do next and what directions we need to go in. Um, so it's, it's very, very common. And um, Agile is uh, um, actually uh, exerting quite a bit of influence right now. Um, and it's, it's really taking hold. So institutional IT um, architecture approaches, they're really kind of two primary flavors that um, seven in 10 institutions tend to adopt one or the other. And the first approach uh, that's most common is that uh, they buy multiple major systems from multiple major vendors, and then they integrate those locally. And that way you can get what's called sort of a best of breed. So you might go one place for your learning management system, another place for your student information system, and another place for your financial system. You integrate them both. But the other approach is to take a bad place of bet on one vendor and adopt their architecture and follow that approach. And quite a few institutions also do that. And then the rest of these um, are either we create our own standards completely, that's the percent <coughs> to some kind of combination of these three. Um, and 5% uh, don't have any particular architecture at all. Uh, changing conditions, new opportunities. Uh, so uh, moving to the cloud really is a fundamental rethinking of how IT services and systems are delivered, or it can be. And many colleges and universities are adopting what they're calling a cloud-first strategy. And what that means is, from now on, whenever we buy something, we look first at trying to buy it in the cloud. And what the cloud can mean, it can mean a, a, a whole bunch of different things, but roughly, it can mean that you're putting your data center or your infrastructure, you're having somebody else manage that, maybe, um, uh, um, Amazon or, 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 or somebody like that. It can also mean that you're putting platforms out there that you then develop on, but you don't have that locally. Um, or you're putting whole software applications out in the cloud. And that's actually the, the piece that most people are most interested in doing and most hopeful about. So um, you can see that cloud is a trend that is affecting um, high quality. Um, uh, and it's affecting all kinds of colleges and universities. It was the one trend we looked at that was really impervious to institutional size and type. And then mobile devices, well, um, that's just huge, huge. And it really dominated our top 10 strategic technologies this year. Uh, so these are all the trends that we did measure. I mentioned that we measured trends. IT complexity was the most influential trend, uh, and uh, the other three trends with it as well are uh, either exerting a major influence or already incorporated into the strategy of 61% or more of institutions. Uh, IT complexity is actually responding to the fact that oh, it's so darn complex. There are so many things we want to do with IT. There are so many systems. There are so many things that we want to talk to one another. How do we manage and team the complexity? Um, and then you can see down, uh, um, down at the bottom, um, software-defined networking, uh, notion reduced reliance on the service desk, uh, where you know people will go and help themselves and, and things like that. Um, those trends are having a really good impact. So our advice: um, first of all, uh, certainly more and more colleges and universities, as I talk with them, we're talking about standardizing, adopting standards reducing customizations so that maybe the way we pay bills or hire people, maybe it's really not so different from most of the other colleges and universities in this country. So maybe we could standardize and not customize so much because customizations are more about, well, I've always done it this way. Um, and maybe we need to get over that so we can save money because customizations tax you every time you operate those systems. But you have to know your culture. And so before you just willy-nilly say, no more customizing, we're going to standardize, cloud first, <coughs> some of these other buzzwords, understand what your culture will actually um, be willing to do. Because the last thing that you want to do is overreach and have your culture um, that far um, uh, Enterprise architecture is not, it's not a blueprint that you just create 
That's your guide. It's static. You can print it out. Maybe you may need to make some notes in pencil, but it's one of them. <coughs> Enterprise IT architecture is always changing, always evolving. So it needs to be managed and updated. Um, we really do advise that as you think about Agile uh, methodology, there, there is a place for it, and it seems to be very, very useful. Think about taking that metaphor of minimum viable product, taking those next few steps, and then adjusting, reorienting, setting the compass point, learning from there. Think about how you might apply that to other concepts like culture and operations and services as well. Um, when possible, um, try not to customize. And right now, vendors will tell you this. They'll go out and say, you, well, you know, we know you want to save money. We know you don't want to customize, but we know you want us to meet your needs. So you can configure anything in the system. And so configuration is the new buzzword as opposed to customization. Um, and you always have to cut through um, vendor hype so you really know what you're buying. But you do want to make sure you can configure <coughs> rather than customize. Because customize means all the kind of code that you have to maintain through multiple versions. Configure is uh, actually, you know, using the switches and widgets and tools that the software came for, came with, and uh, have classification standards for data, because really what this is all about. We're not running networks for network's sake or data centers for data sake. Um, we we have a lot of data that we're managing, and a lot of this data can be very powerful, especially when we apply analytics to it, really put it to work. And so think about how you classify that data um, because that will help you think about who should have what levels of access to the data, appropriate and inappropriate uses of the data, as well as policies and guidelines about how to secure those data. Um, bottom line, good enterprise architecture can make IT and the institution more effective, but the opposite is also true. If you have bad architecture and don't have an architecture, that can actually impede you. So let's talk about optimizing technology and teaching and learning. Let's, let's get out of the IT shop, talk about teaching and learning. Um, quote uh, here, uh, and, and faculty are really, really key um, to this solution. So we say in, in IT that there are three things that are important, people, process, and technology. Technology is the easy part. It's the people in the process that's hard. So here's some data. Um, so we know, uh, this was a study that we did about a year and a half ago of e-learning. Um, and we say e-learning um, because uh, that's an, a very expansive definition of using technology and teaching and learning. It doesn't have to just mean all online courses. Um, well, we know that 85% of institutions say that it's a strategic priority. Um, but, and, 9 and 10 are worried about their ability to keep up other institutions. So it's really important about how many keep up. Um, in the past year, half of undergraduates have taken a completely online grad, uh, course, and one third of faculty have taught an online course. So this is not a fringe thing. And then most institutions, eight in ten, offer at least several in a significant number. Um, so, when you think about using technology in teaching and learning, don't start with the technology. Start with your learning, your online learning, your teaching and learning strategy. Rather than we've all got to go to online learning and, and that's what's important. Or, um, you know, I've been hearing a lot uh, about um, this, this virtual reality and these games things, so everybody's got to do games. What's your strategy? Right? Who are the people that you serve? And what distinguishes MSU in teaching and learning? It might be types of teaching and learning. It might be an experience, a residential campus. That's an important part of your culture. How can you use technology to reinforce that culture? And so start there. And there are different investments that may align better with different strategies. And this is an example. We did a series of papers that we released last, last summer with funding from the Lumina Foundation. There were a series of papers, um, online learning, uh, personalized <coughs> pathways, information security, and administrative IT. And they were all written for leadership 
um, for presidents and provosts to read about IT. And this is taken from one of those papers. So we know that students say that online learning and technology is really important to them. And it's important in three very, very critical ways. It helps them today, succeed today, in their courses today. They believe that it will prepare them better for educational success, and they believe that it will prepare them better for the workplace. So they're thinking about what's going to happen outside. Um, MOOCs, uh, um, 2012 was the big year of the MOOCs. And here's some, some data that we found. And what we like to do in Educause is we like to take these concepts and we like to put the data behind them so you can really see what's happening. So <coughs> what we know is that a lot of institutions are delivering online learning. And a lot of students are taking online learning. But if you narrow it down to MOOCs, which have arguably gotten more of the press, there's not a lot of action in today's traditional population or by today's traditional institutions. You can also see, however, that MOOCs, because they have been talked about so much, have captured perhaps a larger than proportionate share of leadership's mind share and interest than is actually happening on the ground. Uh, here are our projections for technology growth in the area of learning technologies. Um, and so uh, you can see these little dots. The gray dots mean we think it's going to stay in experimental uh, technology, or only in uh, one in five or less of institutions. And as the dots get bigger and darker, um, uh, that's when we think it's, it's going to grow and grow and grow into more uh, and more institutions. So these were the new learning technologies that we we're trying to track and see what their growth is like. Um, and the themes that you really see are um, delivering teaching and learning content to mobile devices. Um, there's a lot of work in that, a lot of work in analytics, either at the course level, how am I doing in this course, or at the overall degree level, how am I doing toward achieving my degree. Um, and uh, there's interest in, in, in trying to lower the cost of educational resources. Um, that students have to purchase. So you're seeing growth in e-textbooks, but you're also seeing growth in um, open educational resources, the third from the bottom. So it's one that goes from gray, gray um, to uh, a medium-sized orange dot. And then another thing that's interesting to keep an eye on as you do your visioning and strategic planning is <coughs> called Next Generation Learning Management System. Learning management systems are going through a period of, uh, of, of, of reinventing themselves <coughs> and kind of reforming and forming and unforming uh, and uh, with primarily I think driven by the interest in analytics and the interest in uh, being able to add some of these decision-making tools and use the data to these systems and you see perhaps a blending of learning management systems, student information systems. Many people think the learning management monolithic system will go away and will be replaced by components and best of breed. Uh, so there, there's a lot of change in that field too. Now what about attitudes toward online learning? How do students and faculty really feel? Well, this is from our study this year um, in uh, September of faculty and their use of and thoughts about information technology. We had uh, 17,000 uh, <coughs> from about 151 colleges and universities um, participate in this survey. This is a great bargain. If MSU wants to participate in our faculty or our student study, you can participate for free. Um, and you can use our survey and uh, we will, we will uh, be the data collection engine. And in exchange for that, uh, you won't just uh, contribute to the public report, but you will also get a report back to you, a little spreadsheet that shows, here's your results at MSU, and here's how to compare with other types of institutions. So it's a great deal, we have wonderful plans. But you can see overall, on a scale of one to 100, Faculty overall, on average, are positively disposed toward technology. And they use it quite a bit. So this myth that it's the faculty are holding us back, really, on average, the faculty are interested. And that experience matters. Their interest and willingness to use technology matters. Because when we ask faculty um, about what they thought the benefits of online learning were, we found that faculty who had had experience with online learning 
saw more benefits in online learning. Now, I'm not going to impute any causality to this because maybe it's the, um, the committed who are drinking the Kool-Aid and know this tastes good because I'm drinking it because I like it, um, you know, who knows? And, um, uh, and it may be that the ones who have a child are uh, predisposed to, to dislike online learning. Um, but might be interesting maybe if uh, you bring a little water to those ones who haven't tried it, that they may develop a taste for it. Um, these are technologies that faculty have told us in that survey would make them more effective instructors. <coughs> and um, my overall uh, summary of this is content trumps devices. So 3D printers, which are really cool, right? But faculty, yeah, about a quarter of them say that would make me a more effective instructor. But they're really focused on the content, the learning management system, um, online collaboration tools, free web-based content, and games is another one. Um, so motivation, 78% of faculty have a growing interest of incorporating technology into teaching and learning. And when we ask them what would their motivators be for incorporating more technology into their classes, and we gave them a list, the top one was not, it'll affect my tenure and promotion. It was not, I'll get paid more. The top one was evidence that it would benefit students. And that's what we really see when we ask faculty other types of questions. If they, they're all for things that will benefit the students. And so when you think about making a case with faculty for technology, well, you have to be able to make that case. Our advice, um, first articulate your learning strategy. And then understand how technology can further and advance your learning strategy. And translate that into a roadmap that you can prioritize because none of us have unlimited resources and so you do have to make those prioritization um, decisions and so make them with your strategy in mind and the investments that you want to make. Um, make sure that you understand that today delivering instructional technology does really take a village. There are a variety of roles. There are people who are expert in the technology itself. <coughs> people who are expert in pedagogy. Right? Just how to teach effectively, no matter what the medium is. Um, the faculty who are experts in their domain and know how they teach well. And all kinds of other roles, librarians who can bring together and find those content sources. And very often the library is the house of the teaching and learning excellence um, center. So bring those all together and make sure <coughs> that you invest in the faculty. Give them the time that they're going to need to really refactor their courses. Um, and uh, bottom line, make sure that technology fits institutional culture and strategy that you better at now. So finally, supporting users in the new normal. Um, so the new normal is people are bringing mobile devices. Online education means that uh, you've got to support these end user <coughs> devices to deliver your content. Um, people are wanting uh, to move things to the cloud. We're moving things to the cloud. Um, and, uh, and, and so on, and there's also security issues. Um, so there's demand for more support, more kinds of support 24-7. So here's some data that we have. Well, we know that um, students are bringing more and more and more diverse devices to institutions. It just keeps going up and up. Um, and it's not just students, it's administrators and faculty, staff, and visitors as well. So more devices are coming. And those devices need support. Um, network performance is continued to be a challenge. Um, these devices don't, you don't just bring the devices to sit in your lap and not connect to the network. You want to connect to the network with your devices. And so that puts a lot of stress and strain on our wireless networks and a lot of expectation that those wireless networks will be ubiquitously available. You know, I want to study out on, on the grass and I want to be able to access library resources. Um, and so, you know, you, you've got to have that robust. Um, we're having visitors come to campus. They need access to the wireless and, and so on. Um, uh, and then IPV, so uh, uh, this is, um, this is a, a nomenclature and a way of um, identifying devices so that they can connect and talk to the network. And IPv6 is a new standard. And the whole thing that you need to know about that is we're, we've run out of 
um, regular IP numbers, so we've got to come up with longer numbers, and particularly as we move to the Internet of Things. Gartner is predicting that more sensors and devices with embedded sensors and, and chips um, with the Internet of Things, that more of those will have IP addresses than our end user devices by 2030. Um, so you can see the plans to implement IP6 right now. Students' experience with mobile. Um, and you can see that students are reasonably satisfied um, with mobile at their institutions. Um, and this is institutions' progress um, on an ongoing basis, delivering mobile applications. And um, the little dot is where they were in 2011. Then the larger dot and that kind of uh, um, sort of tail shows how much progress they've made in 2013. And so you can see academic uh, resources and communications is, and, and also campus services to a lesser degree where more, um, more uh, progress has been made, less in administrative services like access to financial aid or something from a mobile device. Um, IT is seeing a continued demand, that's what this chart is showing, whether it's from students or faculty, whether it's for administration or research. Um, they're making progress. They think they're in better shape than they were in 2011, but uh, they still have a lot of progress to make. Uh, and then uh, faculty opinions about IT support um, are a little less specifically <coughs> than student opinions. Um, we asked them last year whether the institution had an agile approach to IT infrastructure. Maybe about a third said yes, and the rest disagreed. Um, and the extent to which uh, about half and half thought their institution was doing a good job of supporting these IT consumerization and mobile and BYOD demands. Help desk is a big part of providing user support. Um, not surprising, uh, we see that uh, we're, we're quite good at supporting the standard um, laptop and desktop operating systems. And that what we tend to do is offer full support, best effort support, or no support. So you can see that when we're getting into the mobile devices, help us say they support them, but at a best effort level also. Um, and that's very common. Students don't use the help desk much. They really use peers or the internet when they have IT problems. Faculty are still very reliant. <coughs> Um, and then uh, what do they think um, and how do they rate the, the help desk? Um, the the walk-in services of the help desk or the phone services for faculty and walk-in are rated pretty highly and then some of these others a little bit less, but you know, pretty good grades to the help desk. Uh, knowledge management is a great way to take all, how do you think when you call the help desk, um, the person on the other end can possibly not answer your question. Well, ideally, they have some sort of a knowledge base so they can look up some of the answers that don't come to mind and some of the solutions to tricky troubleshooting problems. So more and more institutions are deploying knowledge management systems themselves. And this is a precursor toward maybe sharing help desk services and going 24-7 um, or outsourcing part of your help desk services, outsourcing the easy <coughs> questions and the like. So we see more of that. And our advice, um, make sure that you've got good data security policies in place. So um, they're in place for mobile and cloud, as well as everything else. Uh, think about a mobile device management solution, but they're, they're really um, uh, only if they fit, fit the culture. Um, make sure that you really manage IT support as a profession. And there's a whole profession of best practices and standards and, and tools like ITIL and service level agreements and service catalog. And uh, so ask yourself whether you're doing that with your IT support. Invest in knowledge management and um, uh, make sure that you don't forget about accessibility and ADA compliance when you move into online education. So the users aren't going to adapt to you. We've got to adapt to you. And these are the top 10 issues, so it's a little bit longer than 30 minutes. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, I'll give you some useful information. Good questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes? Item number one, that it's integrated in all of the other steps. How do you define what a qualified person is, and at what level of the organization do you think that should carry over? Um, I'm a 
firm believer in having leadership navigate the ship and set the tone, and then empowering and hiring good, good managers who can make those good decisions about the services that they have to offer um, and, and the, the areas that they have to support. So that's my answer to end question. Um, this is really remaking um, IT, and you can even extend it to higher education in many ways. As IT organizations are really, truly changing, um, today's IT organization needs to be very different from the one even 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And that means that you need different skill sets and different types of roles. Um, the technical skills have never been a problem for the IT people to hire for or to have. And most really good IT people can learn a new technical skill very easily. Well, most good musicians can learn a new instrument. Um, however, what we're seeing also on, layered on top of that is the need for some of these service management and soft skills um, uh, skills. Uh, so things like negotiating skills, ability to influence, ability to communicate. You need that all throughout the organization. You need those sorts of skills more in the CIO and the management um, responsibility. And that can be um, all of those new skills and new roles can mean that you may need to reorganize the IT organization. Um, so it's not just, John, you've got a new job, but maybe, uh, John, you're now the boss of this and this unit, and it's completely different. So it's you need to think about organizational change, and I really encourage a good, strong partnership and reliance on people for that. Um, you need to think about your job descriptions and what you're looking for in addition to technical skills. <coughs> you need to think about the new roles that are coming in and recognizing that, for the most part, you don't have the luxury of saying, we have a new role, so we're going to hire a new body. But very often, it's, we've got a new role, we think this will take maybe 10 hours a week on average. Who's a good person or a good job to pair that role with, to add that to? So sometimes you can make that evolution organic. And at the end of the day, it can be very disruptive to individual And so you really have to think about how you're going to manage that disruption so that you're causing the least pain to the least number of people. Um, having, again, a good partnership with HR, because very often, if I'm a leader of a unit, I can rearrange and restructure my unit. But if I can also work with HR, and think about opportunities in other units at the university where I've got somebody who's really great at this skill and HR can help find them and place them in another area. And always think about your staff. Have a talent professional development plan for your staff so that you, ideally, you will be in the position of having to display <coughs> and disrupt as few people as possible because you've always been looking ahead. You've always been preparing them and arming them for that, that next set of skills. So it can be like an internal relay race. They don't come off it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes? Uh, given your expertise, have you seen any sort of correlation between required professional development or required training for faculty where use of an LMS is uh, concerned and whether or not they are more willing to adopt using such a system? I don't know that we ran that analysis, but I think that we have the data that will enable us to so do, do a post facto sort of right. analysis on that particular set. That's right. What we have seen is we've seen a little bit of a gap between what faculty say they wish they had and what institutions say they're providing. So we'll have many faculty say, I just wish, you know, I could go to somebody and, and you know, have a, a, a designer help me develop my course, and then you find the institution is already offering that service. So what accounts for that gap? Right, so I'd be curious to see if there was a correlation with institutions that require use of such a service. Places I've worked previously have done that, but they don't have data either that they've actually seen if there is a relationship between the two. Yeah, and that's very often where you get into the issue of culture. And um, what is the culture at your institution? And to what extent and under what circumstances do you require things of 
faculty, of, of senior leaders, of professionals, and to what extent uh, don't you? So it's the difference, as, as we used to say in my institution, of policy with a capital P and policy with a lowercase p. Other questions? Yes. Uh, so I graduated from Missouri State in 2013 from the business school here. And Congratulations. Uh, thank you. And I now work for IBM in Smarter Education. And I was wondering, I heard you talk about online collaboration within the universities between students and faculty. Where do you see the future of online collaboration in schools? Um, I think it's going to grow. And this, this really is kind of part of the way higher education is truly at, um, at its own inflection point, um, going from that model that we're doing today, right? Sage on the stage, right? And I'm here talking to you um, to experimenting with different models of pedagogy um, to something as simple and experiment as a flipped classroom. Do your homework first, and then we'll explore the implications of that. So you come in already partly educated to um, truly collaborative and teamwork and those interactions and those small group um, activities. I see that a lot. And I think part of where you see it is also in K-12. There's a lot more project work and emphasis on project and teamwork and a lot less emphasis on, you know, be the individual who excels at all, you know, at, at all things the way it was with my generation. You know, I wanted to be the A plus student with the gold star. And now it's about can you be the A plus team with the gold star? Um, and that teaches you these wonderful skills. So I think it is going to be increasing. And the degree to which technology can facilitate that collaboration so it can make those groups perhaps more cohesive over distances, bring in people who are experts who they might not have um, had a privy to, give them working spaces where they can collaborate asynchronously. There's just a lot of great opportunities. We have time for one more question or a 30 second Irish dance. Would you please, please ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> there is a baby grand in the well, if not, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Dr. Bridget. I hope this has whet your appetite for exploring the resources that are available to you in Epicos More. We have a lot of data, but we also have a lot of case studies. So a lot of institutions who have told their story, taken the time to tell, tell their story in all of these issues. And then our events where you can actually connect um, and meet some of those individuals. So um, please avail yourself of this. It's just uh, a great way to extend your own knowledge.